little introduction. Uh, okay, now it's recorded. Um, uh, I mean, a small introduction because I realized yesterday that this is not maybe an Egyptological audience, so I thought it would be good, of course, to have an introduction of what are we talking about in Avaris, what's Avaris, what is she going to talk about. It will be very short, uh, I will be very general in this, so my Egyptological colleagues, please forgive me. Uh, sorry, because... Sylvia, excuse me for interrupting you. Could you put on uh, your PowerPoint on full screen, just start the presentation? Yes, 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 here, now? yes. Yes, this one, yes. Great, thank you very much. Now you can see it? Okay. Yes. <clears throat> yeah? <laughs> okay. So, uh, I will show you a bit more or less uh, the chronological scope uh, and also what varies, and then I will go to the second part of the lecture. So, very generally speaking, um, this is what we talk about when uh, well, the, the chronological scope I'm dealing with in the Levant or ancient zero Mesopotamia, early Bronze Age 3-4 and Middle Bronze Age, very roughly, of course, and in Egypt, Late Middle Kingdom, Second Intermediate Period. This will be more or less a chronological uh, scope, uh, of course, the 2000 BC. Um, and of course, uh, I would present Avaris Teledava. I decided to put this map here because many people would not know where Avaris is located. It's in the northeastern um, Egyptian Nile Delta. And we do know, of course, that uh, by some material and some text, that there was frequent contact between Egypt and the Levant and North Syria Mesopotamia uh, since pre-dynastic times, in prehistoric times, especially around this area, Northeastern Delta. And uh, the epoch we are dealing with is called Second Intermediate Period. For those who don't know, it's mostly characterized by the so-called Hyksos kings that will uh, reign in the northeastern delta because Egypt is supposed to be divided um, in three different dynasties that they fight with each other. Uh, so the so-called Hyksos, in the traditional historiography, of course, until last century, um, traditional historiography recognized the arrival of this so-called Hyksos um, to this part and the seizure of power in a violent manner around 1500 BC. And this is because uh, most uh, most um, periods were reconstructed using this Egyptological text, this Egyptological text like uh, Camoses Tele or Carnarvon, uh, Carnarvon tablet, sorry, or later interpretations such as Flavio Josephus, classical interpretation. So in this text, in this interpretation, it's implied that the Hyksos rulers came to a land that did not belong to them, they should be expelled, and after the um, war of li liberation wars, the war of liberation, the real Egyptian kings of the 17th dynasty expelled the Hyksos and they will never come back, and that was the end of the story. But of course we know that this account is not, it was not like this. We uh, there is uh, plenty of material of Levantine presence, of course, in prehistoric times, and also at this time in the Eastern Nile Delta to uh, document exchange that is continuous more or less in time, of course, depending on the area. And also, uh, we do know that the arrival of this Hicks dynasty was not of, of nothing. So, of course, this was the story before. We have some uh, presence, this is from Beni Hassan in Middle Egypt, and here is mentioned this Amu. Um, we could um, translate this, more or less it has been translated as the Asiatics. So this is much before than the period we are talking about, so we are sure that, of course, these contacts were not um, once in a lifetime, they didn't come violently, and this were happening, of course, um, over a long period of time. Uh, so Avaris, as I said, this is again in the northeastern um, Nile Delta. We have evidence from um, Asiatic presence. I shouldn't say Asiatic, but for the sake of simplicity, please bear with me. Uh, Western Asia, Syria, Mesopotamia. I will say Asiatic to be to be very precise, but we, we know it's not the right term maybe to use. Of course, uh, Avaris Tel El Dava is one of the uh, most famous sites in this regard because um, was already inhabited. Uh, I don't know if I yeah. Here is, it was a harbor town, you can see it here. It was already inhabited in Middle Kingdom. Scattered findings coming from a temple of Senufret II, consecrated by Amenemhat III, came to light in the first years of excavations. And the fame of Tel Eldaba was engrossed, of course, when it was identified with Avaris. Avaris was the capital that the Hyksos kings 
the, the place that the Hyksos king chose as to be the capital of the kingdom. So it was finally identified. Um, there were a few attempts to see where it was about located. In the end, it was identified with Tel Eldaba, where with modern Tel Eldaba. And of course, the fame was in growth. And of, after 40 years of excavation of the Ashton Archaeological Institute, of course, um, we have, uh, as probably many people know, many temples, funerary remains, we have houses. And of course, it came to light and the fame was even, even, uh, even greater. So this is a settlement we are dealing with, and this is a settlement that is part also of my PhD study within the IST advanced grant. Um, and I will show you also uh, very briefly why it's very special, we could say. Avaris um, was, has provided us with extensive religious, funerary, and domestic uh, material, of course. But we have a few things that we could say they are not Egyptians, if I can say that so simply, because um, there are some things that they, we couldn't say they were not found in Egypt before, but they were plainly documented in Syria Mesopotamia in the fourth and third millennium BC. For example, I'm going to mix a bit also here, but just for the non-specialist audience to know, this is the Middle Style House. This is very well known in the Mesopotamian colonies, for example, in the third or fourth millennium. There is one at Tel Eldaba as well. It's not, it's not, has not been found in Egypt before. Uh, this is an example as well, the Tottenhausen, the Egyptians, normally they will have the cemeteries out um, of the city, uh, except for infant burials. But this is a characteristic that we find uh, in many settlements in the Near East or in, in Syria Mesopotamia, um, this vaulted uh, chamber with the adult burials underneath the houses. This is also a custom that is very typical from this all Western Asia, actually. Uh, we have, of course, toga pins that they are used to, has to fasten the tunic and also weapons. Equid burials, of course, uh, this is very so well known in, and very documented in, in Upper Euphrates even, and it appears also at Tel Eldaba. The so-called servant burials as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so I will show you here one of the areas. I always use this um, this area because I think it documents greatly the change of use that happens at Avaris with time. Avaris was not founded as a capital, like some of the capitals we do know, for example, Amarna, that it was founded ex novo, just uh, for the sake of being the capital of a king, so to say. And Avaris was not like that, it started differently, and then it became um, a capital of a kingdom. So in this area, we have phase H. Um, there's not much here. Phase G, of course, every phase is divided, but I will be, of course, very brief in this. This phase is characterized by we have these cram houses, some uh, um, intramural burials. This type of settlement is not what we are used to see in Egyptian archaeology, but also because the settlements we are dealing with, they are mostly, as I said, the official type of, of settlement, and Avari started in a different way. So these cram houses, winding the streets, this is also very typical of this um, Syrian Mesopotamian area. I'm not saying, I'm not implying, of course, anything, but uh, because it could be also because of the nature of how the city will develop. It was founded at a harbour town, commercial town, so of course it's a different type of, uh, of uh, city than we will see in Amarna. But this is what we have. But then we have a change of use. There is um, uh, an epidemic, and then the site, the place is used as a cemetery. And then we have a change of use with the presence of some houses and the temples. And here, the interesting thing is that we have um, Near Eastern type of temple, uh, or Syrian Mesopotamian types of temple, like the bright um, round temple, with Egyptian temples, both together, so, uh, so to say, to be a bit brief. So we have all this mixture here that what's going on. We don't really know what's going on. Well, we know, but we are trying to deal with this, the Egyptian part. And then we have some things that are clearly coming from somewhere else. But how can we make sense of this? So in this area is where my PhD is framed in this IRC advanced grant, the Hyksos Enigma, I'm dealing with settlements and space. So I study how the use of a space is configured in Avaris with respect to other settlements in Egypt, which we don't have many, unfortunately, and not uh, with the same chronological scope, and how is the use of a space in Syro Mesopotamia, ancient Syro Mesopotamia. For example, how streets are distributed, how was the ratio between public and private areas, open areas, temples, where are the temples located with respect to the population. So it's more or less uh, this use of a space, a complete use of a space with a plus, which will be the shape of the houses we encounter. Uh, can the shape of the houses tell us something? 
of course, having into consideration things like pottery or intramural burial, some other things, tell us something about how these people will manage the built environment. Can we actually say, of course, we're not going to talk about a direct movement of people from Syrian Mesopotamia to Egypt, we can never say that, but how can we see um, any similarities on how these people treat space and can this tell us something about, I don't know, maybe the origin of their thought, of course, not the geographical origin of these people, but maybe where can we locate this um, transformation of space or this use of a space? So in order to be a bit more um, not so deterministic, I tried to use to incorporate quantitative methods and of course some um, methods taken from social geography. And this is when I encountered a few problems that deal basically with how we treat um, data in archaeology. And this is what I want to talk about it today. So this is a presentation of a virus. I was very, very brief, so sorry for my colleagues if I missed something. Um, yeah. So again, this is the area I wanted to show you. Uh, this map is mine. It was one of the earliest maps I did. So of course, some sites are missing because it was for another purpose. But then you can see that this area, I would say, in dealing with the type of houses and the disposition of the space, I would say this is very common and very similar. I'm not implying that these people came directly from here, of course, but this is the area where I'm looking for, uh, Upper Euphrates, Upper Tigris. So now I'm going to talk about a bit of theoretical um, considerations, and then I hope that it will make all sense at the end. So archaeology and history naturally, uh, naturally, naturally deal um, with time space challenge. This is our job, of course. And the view of temporality is shared by most researchers, almost by default, um, envisions a sequence of states, a sequence of events punctuated in a line, like as you can see here on the, on the right, that transform one state or one event into another. That will be simple. These states have a duration, okay, and they are more or less continuous. In uh, point A, you can see this will be the same, but with space, okay, this is next to this, it must be neighbor, it must be next to it. Okay, this is a very, very basic representation that is not intrinsically wrong. Uh, but of course, we do know that um, each object or each event, it depends what we're dealing with, even with wars, raining years, pottery, doesn't matter. Each object or each event has a diverse life use, a diverse duration, of course, and this duration interacts with other objects and other events, and it creates a topology of relations, of course. That, and an object can still the same, can be reused, can be discarded, can create another object. So we all know that this topology of cartographic time is actually more complicated and it's multi-layered. So despite this fact being often acknowledged by us, by archaeologists, we say it in conferences, we say it in papers. This does not automatically translate, I would say, into an epistemological change when we are dealing with our data, when, when it's time to deal with our data, right? When it's time to bring the analysis into the table, I would say. So, of course, the difficulty of the archaeological record uh, is, a, is a point here. It's intrinsically incomplete. So this also complicates um, the fact. So as I said, this is not intrinsically wrong. We cannot say that, but of course, we are not taking into consideration the time layers. And sometimes we, we make these mistakes, and for the sake of simplicity, we make these mistakes, and unconsciously, we bring this timeline or this neighbor analysis, like this is next to this, into our interpretations of our, our data. This is what I encounter as well, and I encounter this problem, and I try to solve uh, this, and this is what I will show at the end of the conference. So, of course, um, then uh, we have the period of the so-called quantitative revolution in archaeology. Quantitative revolution in the 70s started with, uh, it came from geography actually, and it wanted to change a bit how we approach space. Because even uh, as we say, we have this timeline in a straight line, the same happened with space. Space is mostly a void place where we pretend that things happen in isolation something that is void, that's waiting for human action to fill it. This was um, a challenge for the archaeologists of the 70s, but actually they tried to incorporate quantitative methods to solve this and say, yeah, we can actually measure this space and how people will interact with this space. But in the end, it backfired, and in the end, it ended up being a bit positivistic and deterministic. 
And then post-processal archaeologists will say, yeah, you are positivistic. You cannot measure space without taking into consideration people and human agency. So the intentions were actually good, and some of these methods are being recovered today, but actually most post-processal archaeologists were right in this sense. It was too strict, too mathematical. So how could we combine both things? So actually, um, they wanted to do a spatial term, but it was a spatial term, bring a space into the picture. But actually, in the end, space was the only thing was talked about, but pure space, natural space. There was nothing else. And of course, we do know that space does not work like this because we interact with space. So, oh, it's not working. Yeah. So again, the backfire came not from archaeology, came again from geography, uh, human social geography. And these people say, OK, we are not actually studying space. Uh, even also in the field of geography, uh, you are being too deterministic, too mathematical. We need to bring human agency and social space into the picture. So I'm going to go uh, very briefly here, but I wanted to show you that I'm trying to incorporate also this, because I think it's very important, this, the discourse of social space, especially Lefebvre, of course, the production of a space. Lefebvre was greatly misunderstood. And actually, he now is taking, is coming back. But actually, even some of his disciples, like Castells, um, actually, I think, unjustly criticized him because they didn't really grasp what he meant to say. Of course, there is natural space. Is there? If I see a mountain, it's a mountain. Is there? No one can say otherwise. But then I have the experience that I have directly with that space, which is actually dependent uh, as well on where I I am born, where I develop. So it's not that one is different than the other, but they interrelate. So Edward Soya, I like um, uh, this, this sentence of Soya that says, the special town cannot be accomplished simply by appending special highlights to inherit critical perspectives. And this is what I thought I encountered in many, many studies um, of settlement archaeology today. They try, they have good intentions, but actually they don't try space. Um, they don't put space into a picture because they keep treating space like a void space, like natural space, so to say, Euclidean space. And that's not like this. Even if we do a landscape reconstruction, we have to take into consideration more things. And that's, that's the difficult thing, the social consideration of a space, how a space was used. So yeah, this is what I wanted to uh, bring to the table today. First. Um, the representation of time in settlement studies has been more often than not ignored or oversimplified. And this happened and happened to the best of us. And actually, we should take into this into consideration. Um, because this stands in the way of um, producing a true special narrative. So another uh, fact is this leads to an impoverished understanding of a phenomenon or of a place. Because we are. Uh, leaving aside not only time, not only space, but also scale. And this will be an issue I will deal with uh, today. Scale is when dealing with this time-space conundrum, a fundamental piece. And I'm not talking only about cartographical scale, that also it's important. That means zoom in, zoom out, being a bigger map, a smaller map, but also phenomenological scale. At what scale do the events happen? I always put the same example, it's a modern time. So example, I'm from Spain. In Spain, we have 40 years of dictatorship. And then there's a transition where Franco died. We have a transition. And then we have supposedly democracy. Right, this is a general scope. This is a general process that happened. But that doesn't mean that the lives of the people, of course, lives of people were affected. That's, that's, there's no doubt about it. But some people will go on with their, li with their lives, with their jobs, the same. So a general process does not mean that the lives of the people were affected immediately. People didn't woke up, didn't wake up one day in Middle Bronze and say, oh, now we are Middle Bronze people. So the scale is important. We are using an analytical scale to analyze things because we need this. We need this position. We need to divide events to understand uh, what are we talking about. But we, don't, we shouldn't confound this with um, the processes that are behind. And as I, at least I encountered in settlement um, archaeology, this is often the case. And the last one will be uh, an unconscious oblivion to the fact that social space is not um, Euclidean space. I mean, if I am measuring a settlement or a 
um, palace or a map, that, that's perfect, that's um, fair, but that's not social space. That's natural space, um, it's purely physical space. I'm measuring a property, but that doesn't mean that I'm analyzing social space. And this must be must look superfluous and why is she talking about this but you will see in the example i will put that I, for me i think it's quite um, quite relevant to bring these issues into a table and see how are we dealing with our data when treating with space and time so i, I will mention here briefly because it occurred to me that the topography of praxis i'm also using the Bourdieu and Rapopot. they are very useful i'm not gonna go of course into this but to see how people will interact with this space and also how space also influence people. Um, but yeah, so it's not it's not one way. It's not just humans just go and modify the natural space or it's just that we are only influenced by our surroundings. It's a, a symbiotic relationship, we could say. And when we are dealing with a normal plan on a normal map, we are not paying attention to this um, to these constraints or to these issues. It's valid. We should do that, but we should acknowledge what are we dealing with. We should not. We should try not to extrapolate things. So, uh, is it possible to make an analysis of habitational patterns, sediment studies without challenging first this spatiotemporal paradox? In my, in my opinion, in my case, for the data I'm dealing with, I don't think this is the case. We should first challenge our epistemological construction. How are we dealing with our data? Because the way we, de we approach our data also matters. So here I say, like this uh, sentence, I like this sentence, the choice of a relevant transformation of time. So it, the same that we are very proficient in choosing what time are we dealing with. If I am specialized in a second intermediate period, of course it's not the same that it will be the Middle Kingdom or it will be an Ptolemaic period. Or someone who is dealing with Middle Ages um, uh, is not the same that someone who is studying contemporary politics. So the choice of a relevant transformation of time resembles the choice of relevant map scale. Because a poor choice scale could give the impression that, for example, two objects or two events, it doesn't have to be an object, coexist, when in fact they never did. We should stop, um, associate, we should stop associating archaeological correlation, uh, archaeological, um, yeah, correlation, so to say, that they are two strata are together in the field with uh, automatically correlated human practice. That's, that's not how it works. And even though, as I say, we acknowledge this, we say it, we debate it, we say it in conferences, then when the analysis comes, the analysis ha has these mistakes inside. And I, I encounter myself the same with my data, the same, uh, so to say, tyranny. Um, so timelines and frames, of course, are useful to ease the narration of history, we need maps, we need timelines to make our points, to visualize things, to visualize facts. They're useful. However, it's not possible to make a meaningful analysis without first acknowledging first what data are we dealing with. Because it's not the same if I'm studying pottery, that if I'm studying, I don't know, polynological analysis, that if I'm studying sediments, or I'm studying sediments at what, a small scale, houses, or uh, the big scale, landscape environment, it's not the same. And, of course, this scale. At what scale were they operative? I found uh, in many conferences that even people criticize each other because you're not using this methodology, you should be using this. But, and sometimes what I see is a difference in, in material. Of course, someone that studied landscape cannot be expected to do the same type of analysis that pottery analyst or the other way around because it's not the same. They are studying processes occurring at different scales. That doesn't mean that one, is, um, one process cannot be seen in another scale, but sometimes they're very different. Maybe one is short-term change, the other one is long-term change. And we don't actually um, uh, reflect about this often, I would say. So this is why I'm dealing all the time with scale. There are different scaling levels. First, of course, depending what can be analyzed. This is our analytical scale, what I take. I take a map, I take a time frame. And this is my analytical scale, what I use to make sense of the data I have or the data I work with. And this is mostly related to a Euclidean space, natural space, something that can be measured and can be even reconstructed in the case of paleo environments. But then we have the scale of how these, actually these observations are internalized first by me as a researcher and also by the people who 
suffer or live under these conditions. And this is highly dependent on experience. As I say, an obvious fact is that a mountain or a river, that's obvious, that's natural, it's given, it's there. But another different thing is that if I go with my phone and don't even pay attention, I don't experience the same that someone, maybe it's a very religious person, I don't know, a storm comes, a bird passes, and then at the same time, this person looks at the picture, um, sorry, at the mountain and said, wow, what a revelation. So, of course, the experiences are different, and they cannot be studied at the same scale. I cannot pretend to study everything at the same scale. This is why I see sometimes this debate between phenomenological approaches and more technical approaches. They shouldn't be exclude. They shouldn't exclude each other, actually. Maybe we are dealing with different experiences and with different scales, and we try to make the most of it uh, without killing each other, so to say. So these scales, they do not necessarily overlap. They can, of course, but they do not necessarily overlap. Again, processes occurring at one scale do not automatically reflect in a larger scale. As I said, with the sample I put of the uh, Spanish politics, we have a process in a larger scale, which is this obvious change. We have a dictatorship, and, um, and the dictator died, and then now we have a democracy. This is a fact. It's there. Maybe there's changes of laws, but for some people, their everyday lives are the same. So um, we should be careful not to extrapolate one thing into the other. Of course, this change in politics will bring about some changes, but this will take time. As I said before, we cannot expect people to say, oh, I woke up in the second intermediate period. We cannot say this. Or now I'm, uh, I'm Asiatic, or yesterday I was, uh, was Asiatic, and now I'm Egyptian, because sufficient time passed, and now I feel Egyptian. It's, it's, I think it's, it's a bit more complicated like this, and we should not be framing events in, in this way. And of course, as I say, individual experience is not uh, general processes. Sometimes the issue is not um, using a larger or smaller scale, which of course is, is necessary, taking a map, uh, studying at a local scale or a bigger scale, of course this is important, but knowing our data. What data are you using? It depends. And then you should be able to frame in this scale and see what you're looking for, not trying to extrapolate from other, uh, from other methodologies maybe you used in the past for other things. So, uh, the, the first problem starts with the compilation of data. Uh, luckily, in archaeology or in historic history, we have more or less a methodology, of course. Uh, we all know how we should compile this data. But still, there is a, um, an element of subjectivity, of course, and we should be aware of this. It's not, that doesn't have to be perfect, but mistakes happen. But still, the compilation of data is very important. We normally work also with data from other people. And sometimes we take a blind spot and we say this is valid or this is not valid. We don't even analyze this data. So sometimes when we try to analyze, as I say, this data, I have the impression that we are seeing, uh, and this is not my sentence, I read it um, a few weeks ago, like as we are as foragers in the search for methodologies, which is good, it's valid. We should use advances in geography, advances in mathematics. This is great, we should use it, but we should be uh, careful of what are we using and for what purpose, because otherwise we look like we are foraging, we are taking, and then we are not making actually a good sense of what we are using. And this can become um, uh, a tyranny. We can have many tyrannies, tyranny of material things, the tyranny of ethnographic records, tyranny of familiar things. And in this sense, it occurred to me that also I, uh, this uh, person was talking about these tyrannies, and I came with this one, tyranny of the digital humanities. Uh, maybe someone used it already, but it, it's perfect, because I thought I almost was um, also a victim of this tyranny, and many of us are victims of this tyranny of the digital humanities. The most known, of course, is RGIS. This picture is not mine, the one on the top left. A geographic information system is a system designed to capture, store, and manipulate, analyze, manage, and present all types of geographical data, more or less. It will be what is a GIS. Of course, I'm going to talk about GIS here, but this, can, this tyranny of data humanities can apply to another spatial software. Again, I'm talking about sediment studies and landscape studies. I'm not dealing with text, for example, text recognition. I'm not dealing with this. So this is another issue. I'm talking about uh, what I encounter and what I'm familiar with, which is spatial tools and spatial analysis. So why I'm saying this? Um, 
I'm going to uh, follow my papers because I forget to follow my papers and then uh, I don't want to miss in anything. So bear with me a bit. Um, yes. So, <clears throat> as I said, this special tyranny that I call tyranny of the digital humanities uh, can be followed by the reification trap. That is also in the title of this conference today. The use or misuse of digital humanities or digital tools, spatial software, has implications for the creation of a spatial narrative, right? Uh, normally, contrary to what is intended by the researcher in the first place. And this leads to this creation of non-spatial discourse. These images are mine, by the way. I'm using my own example as a bad example, although it's not a bad example because it is useful for other things. But uh, I will show you what I had to deal with. So the spread of geographic information systems, of course, has meant that myriad projects dedicate a significant amount of time to the study of sediments. Because this software, more or less anyone with a crash course can actually get used to it and put data and create a nice and colorful map. And they are very useful to display uh, data, of course. But this um, basic, so to say, um, GIS uh, features make use of measure, measure Euclidean space, natural space. They incorporate scale compression. This is also good. This is not the same than social space. And the problem is that when we try to do things like creating a narrative from these maps that I'm presenting here, on the bottom left, you can see this is a map in GIS and the database, spatial uh, database. So this is great. We have our points located in uh, precisely uh, in a point where we, 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 we do zoom in or zoom out. It's, it's always located. It's perfect. But actually, uh, this is an analysis or it's a visualization. Sorry to say this is a visualization. We are not dealing with space here. Well, are we dealing with space, with Euclidean space, right? But these are points in a place, in a time, and they're static. And sorry to say, but most GIS used uh, by many archaeologists, although there are many, many archaeologists like Enrico Crema, Gary Locke, they are doing excellent things and they try to work with the algorithms of GIS. But many, many people who are, maybe they need it for the project and they do it and it's very valid, but they should be aware that this is not an analysis. This is a visualization of points in, in a map. It's a static, nothing else. Right? GIS, um, the visualization tool of GIS, I would say, is the most basic thing, but it's not the thing for what GIS was mainly created, if we could say it like this. So people who work with this, they don't use it like this, just for pure visualization. But we took this, as it didn't run for years we are, we took this and I can do this, of course. And again, this is valid, but it, this has a context. The problem is that when we try to extrapolate a narrative from this visualization. Because these are points uh, in a map, nothing else. They presuppose that these points, these settlements I'm going to show you now in a bigger picture, you will see it uh, big now, so you know what I mean. It presupposes that they are contemporaneous in time and in space, and this actually is not the case. So be aware that this visualization is valid. I'm not criticizing this use, but we should acknowledge what are we doing. This is not analysis. This is not an archaeological analysis, spatial analysis. This is not it's something else. So as I say, problems, the researcher is not in control of how the data were collected. In my case, I'm using data from all excavations. So I'm just compiling with this data, and I assume they were all right, right? They were um, nicely collected, and the methodology was pristine. So <laughs> it's not the case, because of course, I have to digitize many plants that they were really in a bad condition, so of course. But sometimes we take um, the data as they come, because of course, it's a lot of work. We cannot do everything. And we have confidence in this data, how this data were taken. Uh, it's frequent, as I say, that there is a lack of understanding of the subjacent algorithms of GIS or other software. I will put an example. If we use Word or Excel or PowerPoint, normally you have a default, uh, I don't know, Times New Roman 16. But then you change it because maybe you want to do, improve your PowerPoint or your Word, and then you change the features. We don't do this with GIS or with other spatial software, basically because we don't know how, because this takes a lot of time. 
So then um, the right thing to do, first of all, will be to be able to modify the algorithms that, for example, GIS or the spatial software has to fit your data. This doesn't mean that you have to invent your data, just to fit um, what you, your data uh, needs. In my case, I will show you later uh, what I'm doing. Um, I'm doing a statistical analysis, but again, the statistical analysis uh, is done in R, for example. And R is a package that comes like this, but it was not created for archaeologists. It was created maybe for people who work in the government census, for example. I don't know. They use this. But of course, there is people out there who took the pain to create a package for R for archaeologists. But if I don't know this, I, if I don't dive a bit deep in it, I will keep using the normal R or the normal features that I have. And then, yeah, the result is good looking, but is it actually true? Is it spurious? It's not a good use of the, of the, of the digital tool I'm, I've been offered. Right? So this is actually also very important. How to modify, for example, in GIS, there are extensions that are created specifically for archaeologists, also in open source, to deal with our data. Because GIS was for geographers, not for us. And geographers, of course, they don't deal with these gaps in times or in space like we do, or at least more than geographers, they don't. So first, it should be clear that the suitability of methods should be the first point of every research. Are all methods fit for purpose? That's, um, uh, and I bring this point because I encounter this, and I don't think it's, it's uh, often the case, right? The result may end up being a new frame, a very visual uh, representation in which to show identical perception. So the same perception that I have, but they just in a nice visualization way. So I will show you an example um, how I arrived to this, all this uh, methodological um, mess, I would say. This is a representation of the house types I'm studying. Uh, I took a random uh, 500 years, 2500, 2000 BC. This is already in an article I published um, a couple of years ago. So if you want to know more about this, go there. But I think I wanted to bring this here because maybe that publication is a bit um, close to the Egyptological community, or maybe uh, people who work in another areas, uh, they would like to know about this. Why not? So we have this house form, uh, and you see this spread. Um, we have, I don't know, the most common, we would say, it's central Korea or lateral Korea. Yeah, OK, this is a really nice picture. But then when I tried to see, OK, in these 500 years, how are these houses actually? These houses actually are in use these 500 years? Because uh, I don't think so. Actually, we have the red points. These are sediments which actually are occupied at this time. And we do know this because maybe there are palaces or tombs or pottery, but we don't have, in my case, uh, I didn't take this because they don't have domestic structures. So we do know they were occupied, but we don't have houses. But then I thought, OK, how can I see if this spread of houses and if there is changes this is too, uh, too broad, the scale is too broad, 500 years, what happened if I will reduce the scale? And then, well, these are the type of houses I, I'm more or less looking for. And then this happened. When I reduced the scale to exactly, I took the reports, every report, and I went one by one. The houses some, sometimes were not, they were very general, Middle Bronze Age, OK, no, with nothing can be said. But in some places, you can actually find the exact datation from, of course, archaeologists we deal with. Uh, big gaps of time, not like uh, 60 years, of course, it's a bit more. But you could actually see, OK, this house was in use 200 years. So you could see that the archaeologists were actually able to frame this window. So I took this uh, as much as I could when there was no data, no data. And the picture, actually, when we reduced the centuries, was very discouraging because it was like in this, uh, when, when we reduce the scale, we don't have much data, actually. we it's, Nothing. Well, it's nothing. We could do something with this, but how can we? How are we extrapolating what are, what is happening in the Middle Bronze or in a general scope to um, changes happening at small scale? At a small scale, for example, I don't know population movements. So uh, I took another century, and again the picture changes. That is just a century later, and it changes a lot. So of course I thought. 
I have a problem here because how I'm going supposed to, I mean, the big picture is okay, it's okay for some reason and for some uh, purpose, but how can I talk about these changes in, I don't know, the social space or the use of the space if I don't have enough data? Well, I do have enough data, but I do need to fill these gaps. How do we fill these gaps? And this is where I came about this statistical methodology that I will show you. Because I think in my case, and again, this I, I rated this in this case, um, I think it's the most convenient, but it can happen that someone else dealing with something different, I don't know, pottery, for example, it, it's uh, another picture, another completely uh, picture. So I wanted to see, I don't know if I put it here again. Okay, so this will be uh, a normal so-called time slicing. There are a few ways to deal with this uncertainty. If you see all these pictures, as you can say, uh, bottom right is the complete picture. So, wow, we have so many types of houses. Clearly, the central courtyard is the most. But then when you reduce centuries, mm, we need to be careful. So how can we uh, follow these gaps? How can we fill these gaps? There are a few methods uh, that archaeologists have been trying to, to incorporate. One of them... Uh, it's called time slicing that will be putting different maps like I show you uh, by centuries. I create a map by century and then put them together like uh, some slices, of course, and then I see the picture. And this is valid and it can be done, but it doesn't show um, the change. So I can see there is a gap, maybe. Uh, maybe I know this gap is because um, there is no record or because some places were destroyed, for example. We could say, we, we do know that, for example, but it tells me anything about the nature of this change because I'm just seeing one process goes into the other process, but there is something in between that I'm missing. So time slicing can be a good alternative, but for me, I don't think it was exactly what um, I wanted to, it was not precise enough in this case, because of course I want to take also not just the change of house types, but also what my colleagues were doing with tombs, for example, uh, with uh, pottery, uh, or migration, or materials. So, of course, I'm not alone. I need to, to incorporate material from more people. So, time slice maybe is uh, to a static picture. So, as again, change is not seen as a process. It's simply an image, and then another image on top of it. Yeah, this is the result of the change, but I, I want to see what happened, what happened in between. Change is a function of time and it needs to be modeled. We need to mark change. As I said, in time slices, there is a change, but we need to model this change. And here there's a great, um, this is misunderstood because some people that are against these new technologies, they think sometimes that modeling change means making up change and it's not making up change. You just try to use your data and to create a picture of how this change will look like. But you need to create various pictures, not just one. You need to work with various models. If you do a car function or if you do a neighbor analysis, you need to do various models with different type of data to see what the picture will look like, right? And again, this is not a representation of reality. People think, oh, this is too deterministic. How can you say, no, this is a model that can accompany our hypothesis, our work hypothesis. This is, not to, this is not meant to represent a picture of the world like it is. It's just a help, a tool. So, in my opinion, this will significantly expand the explanatory power of our data. Also, if we are able to find the right methods for the right data, of course. Of course, unnecessary computation must be avoided. Sometimes we don't we don't have data, you know. For example, I wanted to mention here, for example, I, uh, my first contribution to this was um, 2019, I think, uh, and I did an experiment with urban syntax, with death map software. And I did with this area, I show you a two of Tel El Daba, because I think it's a great area, because it shows uh, the change of use of, of a place from more or less domestic, so to say, to a bit more of a cultic area. So I, I applied this death map software um, to see if the software could recognize some changes uh, without me saying actually nothing. And actually the results were very pretty the same. But again, you have to um, modify the, um, the algorithms of the, of the program to, to work with your data. Recently, this has been applied by one of our colleagues to another area 
which of course is, is great. Um, but I must say, uh, Dr. Madit, uh, I must say that this example exactly, I wouldn't have used this example for urban syntax for that map. Why? Because this example was a very small area, and not only a very small area, but we didn't have periods, so to say. We didn't have, um, we just have one picture, right? One, one period of occupation. So you can actually not see any changes, and actually the area was too small for this software, and the results were a bit tautological. I, with this, I mean, it was obvious what the result will be without applying the software. So we must avoid unnecessary computation. First of all, because it takes a lot of time to deal with this software. And sometimes the result we see is not a result of the software, but of our data. So we should differentiate between these two things. If we apply this and then the result is great or it's not great, but maybe the data were not fit for purpose. Another option is TimeCube. TimeCube or 3D, that is actually not 3D, uh, is great. But in my case, I don't think it will work because in this case, the spatial temporal processes are lost. They are also static, in my opinion. Events of different character and different duration are treated equally in all cubes. So with, in my case, it's not the same, it's not the, it's not the case. And they tend to present events as cumulative, even though it maybe it's not the intention of the researcher, this time cube tends to present everything like on top of each other, like everything is following, there is no um, happening, there's no contemporaneity, if we could say it like this. So Locan Harris, uh, and I also presented this in, in our final workshop uh, of the Higgs Enigma, but it was very brief because uh, it was not, uh, I was talking about something different, but I presented this as well because I think it's a great method, but this is conceptually is good, but it's difficult to apply. Gary Locke and Harris, they try to apply a probability model. So they say basically, uh, what's the probability of this event? In my case, it will be a house of being inhabited or not during this time period I'm dealing with, during these centuries. The problem with this is that it's very subjective. Even though we try to be objective, it's very subjective. Because of course, unless you have a compilation of data that is great, it can be very, okay, what, do I give a zero, a 0 0.5 or one? So it's very subjective. So maybe for some data, maybe from people working in more recent periods that they have uh, stratigraphic units that they're great and they don't have any miss piece of information, maybe they would be great. So for me, conceptually, this is good. I wouldn't know, uh, I would use it, but not with much confidence, I would say, this probability of use. Because of course, again, in the case of houses, how are we mm, dealing with reuse, for example? It, it some, sometimes we see a new floor, but sometimes maybe the floor would just be I wipe a bit and then reuse again. How are we dealing with this? How can we actually be sure this is a reuse or is a continuous use? It's actually different. So, but it's a possibility this uh, to treat this uh, fuzzy temporal boundaries. And then what they do with this is basically to create means. This is a simple mean, the weighted mean, and combine this with different methods. In this case, maybe. C14, maybe pottery, maybe morphology. As I said, this is from 1994, so conceptually it's great, but it has not been applied in this sense much because I don't think, I think it's very difficult to first to provide the probability of use. Of course, the means can be done later, but I, I think it's a bit uh, subjective, I would say. But it will be, a, it will be a, um, a point, and then you will have more or less a means to see, okay, with this simple mean, with this weight mean, and other methods, which one is more approximate to, uh, to, the, to the other researchers or the other methods, for example. So derived from this, I am using and I will be using a different one, which is heuristic weighting. That also, when I see my data, I will see if it, it will work or not. So heuristic weighting, I will show you very briefly how it works. And this is a paper from Enrico Crema, which is a great archaeologist, and he does amazing things with this um, with the spatial software. So if you you see on the left pit house counts, okay, he's studying pit he's studying pit houses in uh, Jomon period in Japan. The first bar diagram that you see it's used uh, roughly all the pit houses in like we'll say. Uh, big period, 500 years, for example, a thousand years of datation. Like I said, as I told you before, Middle Bronze Age, very random. So we have 92% of the data because all together, it's brought all together. 
but actually, mm, okay, the bars look good, okay, middle German, there is more, and late German, there is less. Okay, this is a fair picture, but Crema said, okay, what if I change and I reduce the scale? Again, I point out, this is not valid for every data. Of course, you have to know your data. How, how exactly can you, of course, date uh, your material? So he tried to reduce the scale between 50 and 400 years. Of course, the material he used was less, was 78%. But if you see uh, the bars, the, the middle graphic, the picture changes a bit. And when he used a bit less material, but much better dated, 50, 100 years, this is a great resolution. We cannot maybe aspire to this in, in, our, in our area, but maybe 100 years will be a good, a good point. If you see the bar diagram, is much more hopeful, I would say. So what this heuristic weighting does is that you put your data with as much resolution as you can. In my case, I'm trying to use centuries, right? And if I don't have data, I say there is no data. If there is a destruction, I say there is a destruction. There is data, but we do know this is, so to say, this is the end of the period. So it's different. Lack of data with uh, uh, with uh, data that is, for example, destruction or a, an abandonment is different. We should differentiate it. This is why I say all the time that we have to know what are we dealing with, because we need to enter the data. If we enter lack of data, uh, the same that we enter, for example, the destruction, the result will be the same, but actually uh, the origin of the data were different. We are mistakenly uh, mixing data, right? So here you will enter lack of data with one value and destruction or final occupation with another value, right? So you will take the smallest resolution possible, you will take this in, in your database, and then you will create a statistic analysis. And this is statistic, what it mm, does, more or less, is to calculate the possibilities of the data you enter, let's say a type of house, uh, what possibilities will you have when you have no data, right? It, this is very important. Uh, of this type of house, or this type of pottery, or in this kind of this type of pit house, to have existed at that point. So this is why I say it's very important that you know your data and that you're honest with your data, and you know what that you are introducing uh, as much as you can, of course, because the result will depend on what you are introducing there. So more or less, it will create a statistical computation of what the outcome will have been, or maybe you can have a nice picture of how the spread of houses will have looked like. Again, you have to know your data, and again, you have to run a few models. You cannot run one and say, oh, this is perfect, it fits. You have to run a few, maybe with different centuries, maybe with different data. You have to combine with different data, because you want to know, at the end, what types of picture can we expect to have, and how does it fit, actually, with, for example, if we have uh, polynological analysis, or we have another people who is doing pottery, uh, it, which one of these is actually better to fit with our purpose or to create, to help to create a narrative? I, will, I, I like to insist in this because I don't think, I don't want people to think that this is something like, oh, this is the result, we should apply it, it's clearly like this. It's just a tool to help. And I think this uh, graphic of Enrico Crema is very, uh, very significant, because if you see the first, this is what all archaeologists would tend to do, like put all in a pot, and then we create these bars. And it's very discouraging. In this case, he at least has data, but there are some gaps in between. And these gaps are actually because we don't have data, or because the data we use were randomly used. This, this is the, the picture that I encountered. It's actually that we have no data or we are not worried about our data or putting our data actually correctly. Again, if you can, some people who come to me and say, oh, look, I'm working in, I don't know, clothes. I can do this. So of course, this will also happen depending on the research area. So I'm talking about my data. I think it will be a good, uh, a good tool to try because I want to see what happened in the period when we have a gap maybe because there is a gap in the archaeological record. But we do know that this site was inhabited. Because as I showed you before, there is a red point that tells me Mari wants to inhabit at this point. We have the letters, we have a palace, we have tombs, but we don't have houses. So you always have to know whether, of course, if, if the, the place is inhabited, you can do anything about it. But I do know 
that there was domestic occupation because we have the portrait, we have people there. But okay, then I have to try to do something else to help my hypothesis. Of course, it won't it won't work. I won't say okay, this is the result, but I think it will maybe give uh, ideas that you maybe didn't think about before. Uh, it, the, at least in this case of settlement and houses. Of course, again, you have to be very careful how you enter your data. As I said, you have to acknowledge when you don't know there's data, there's a lack, or maybe there's a destruction, or you do know for sure there was a reuse, you should also mark this, but of course, it's a lot of work and it's very painful to do. So um, I just wanted to bring this uh, to the fore because I think sometimes we don't uh, worry much about these things and then we create special narratives. Um, and the people who come behind us create the narratives based on what we did first. If I give people the first bar diagram that Enrico Crema did, that you see, you see there in the top left, they will create a much different picture than people that are given the other uh, bars, or people who are given the three of them, right? So um, I hope that this was understood, uh, the heuristic analysis, because it's a bit complicated to explain it uh, exactly to not sound deterministic. Um, but I, I hope that you understood what I meant by this and what I meant by this reification trap. We should avoid unnecessary computation. We should accept that some software is not for us or it's not for our data. Or if it's for our data, we should be able to manage this software and to change the algorithm, so the background, so to say, to fit the data we are working with. We cannot pretend to take an R program, as I said, and apply it directly. Something that is created for a census government uh, today, in the 90s or in the 2000s, to apply it to archaeological data. Yeah, the results will be perfect, super good looking, amazing the statistics, but then uh, is this actually real or is this spurious? So, um, of course, if you have more questions about this, I hope we can uh, talk about this a bit more in the discussion, but I hope it was a bit clear uh, what I meant uh, with this. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed for this very inspiring talk. Uh, I think it raised many, many issues um, and, and gave us a lot of thoughts. And at this point, I would uh, like to start the discussion. I just have to see if I can see uh, the... Ah, great. So um, I would like to open the discussion uh, and uh, would like to ask, are there any questions, please? It was too much. <laughs> <laughs> well. I will, I will kick off. I will kick off. Um, thank you very much, Silva. It was very, very inspiring, really. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, first of all, uh, an archaeological historic question. You, you mentioned an epidemic uh, in your settlement. Uh, do, do you know the kind of, I mean, what was the kind of epidemic? Because you, you showed also burials and so on and so forth. So could you deduce from uh, the tombs um, what kind of epidemic struck the settlement? Yeah, actually, in this, uh, uh, I would like to pass my to my colleague Karen, as I see that is uh, now uh, on screen. Yeah, uh, there's a, an epidemic documented that it was, of course, very probably was very common in uh, Harbor Towns. Uh, I would say epidemic. I don't know. Karen can tell you more because, of course, there are um, a lot of corpses, so to say. <laughs> But I'm not really sure about uh, if there were actually uh, more detailed analysis because I'm not dealing with the funerary. Uh, so Karen, please, if you could uh, clarify this for me, Hilo, that would be great. Um, hello, I don't know if you can hear me because yes, I'm yes. in the National Library, so it might be a little bit loud in the background. Um, well, uh, concerning this, uh, these burials, these were burials that unusual or uh, different to all the other birds we have in all the different phases in Teladaba, they were without any grave goods. They were one or two people buried within one, two. Um, it seems it's a very, very short time period. And it seems that it happens sometimes in haste. 
So we do have a large burial where we have, I don't know, nine or 10 people buried within. They were just simply thrown in. And then other burials that were just following along a wall. Um, and they, they, so that's why the suggestion came up that they might be, um, that they might be victims of an epidemic. But it's also possible that there was a violent, um, something violent happened in the city. Although I have to say that on the skeletons, we didn't see any evidence. But it is precisely at a point in time in the history of the city when there is a massive change coming. So something old stopped and something new came in. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions, please? Actually, I have a question. Yes, please, go, go. Yes, yes, um, please. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you, so you, you're going down to the level, if I understood this correctly, of 100 years time span. Trying to. Yes, but you know that the strategic intelligence is way more refined. We, uh, we have the facing about a generation, more or less. Is this because of the parallels you have to compare with in the Near East, because you cannot um, go to a final level in the Near East, or why are you going to a hundred times scale? This is this is three three layers in Tel Aviv, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, it's a good question because it's most the product of the data. Because sometimes it's very discouraging when you see the reports; they're very old sometimes, especially in Mesopotamia, and sometimes. I would say that the excavators were not able to go further in the case of the houses, right? I'm not talking about any other adaptation. Sometimes they are very, um, they are very imprecise, like 2,000, 2,200. So it's not, a, it's not because I want to, but I don't think I can do much more about this. Maybe there is a few uh, isolated examples that they're better documented, of course, but sadly it's not like in Tel Adaba. So it's difficult. This is why I want, as you said, uh, I have a mis mismatch between what we have in Tel Aldaba, which is what I'm trying to, to study and to compare, and then what we have in the Mesopotamia, and it's too, too, uh, the gap is too wide. How can I infer something with this wide gap, when in Tel Aldaba the gap is actually um, much smaller? So it's more because of the data, I would say. It's not. Um, it's very discouraging because, of course, people in the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, they were more concerned about palaces and temples and great and houses. Okay, yeah, there is a house, there is some pottery. And um, really, it's very discouraging because, except a few places, they didn't even bother. I would say they didn't even bother to date it much. So yeah, that's the reason. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought so. But I have another question which I want to add as well. Are you also doing inter Tel El Daba comparisons like area A2 with area A5 with area F1? I, yeah, I, that's the intention. That's uh, yeah, we should be I, I, we should be doing this, of course. I, I, but I always use A2 because it was the first uh, case study that I did with these urban centers and it's very special to me. But yeah, I will use uh, all of our eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Is there another question? Uh, I would like to to ask you something, Sylvia. Mm -hmm. When you when you uh, showed us uh, the possibilities of modeling uh, and interpretation, uh, I, I was really fascinated because actually. Uh, Honestly, we are confronted with the same issue in the Tabula Imperii Byzantini. It is the same problem. Um, we can evade it. I mean, I don't mean this in a negative way, but we yeah. evade it by, by writing headwords. And when you write in a book on, on certain places, you have a summary of the history of this place. Mm -hmm. But you, you, you don't see, the, I mean, you see the gaps by reading, but you actually you don't see the gaps. So, so the point what I would like to make is, um, in our headwords, you can discern that uh, some settlement was left in the late antiquity, it was destroyed, then you have medieval villages. Um, but as you say, if you put all of this uh, in a map, uh, then of course uh, you realize that uh, it gives the wrong picture. It gives the wrong picture that you have uh, uh, towns, cities, uh, villages, and so on and so forth. So it seems to be very dense 
uh, in, in its settlement structure, but in fact, it is not. If you read the, the headwords and you don't take a look at the map, if you ignore the map and just read the headwords, then you would notice the gaps by reading. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my question would be, um, you said uh, reducing scale, changing scale, which you didn't apply to cartography. I mean, not in this sense. Uh, what is the solution in dealing with gaps? I mean, if, for example, for the north of Macedonia, uh, I have many gaps, should we reduce the area of research in order to come to more uh, detailed and other sources and applying other sources? Uh, I mean, this is my question. Of course, I don't want to change the table in period, but you understand what I <laughs> yeah, mean? Yeah. What, what is the reaction? What is the reaction to gaps? Just stating uh, that we miss crucial data and we have gaps and then we can make a hypothesis or do we change time spans and an area of research in order to deal with it? Yeah, the, that's, a, uh, that's also, this is also very dependent on your data. For example, we have to be aware that even if we change scale, let's mm -hmm. say reduce the scale, that doesn't mean you will gonna have results. Mm -hmm. So that, yes. I don't think that would be the case, <laughs> right? Maybe you will have to have a look at the time span and maybe you have to use another another type of analysis. I don't know, uh, car function or nearest neighbor analysis, point pattern analysis. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could create different analysis at different scales, actually. For example, big scale, smaller scale, but also changing um, the, system, the analysis per se. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because, for example, there is neighbor analysis that mm -hmm. also can be a reification trap because we have a square and we have the sediments. So we say, oh, these are neighbors. Well, you will create, but maybe sometimes you have more uh, cluster in the next uh, square that you are not dealing with. So in this case, it will be useful to be in a, a, in a larger scale. But sometimes the result will, um, if you don't have enough data, the result will be the same. Right. So in your case, I don't know, are you dealing with a lack of data, really a lack of data? Do you think that actually changing the geographical scale would change your result or not? I don't think so, to be honest. I, I think uh, we, we have a lack of data regarding uh, written medieval charters because we have a, a corpus uh, of uh, medieval charters, be it Greek or Slavonic Serbian. Uh, and then you see the clustering, as you said. So you see clusterings of settlements in certain areas where we have many charters. And then you have uh, gaps in the landscape where we need to have had settlements as well according to archaeological data or surveying on the ground, but there's, there's nothing nothing uh, reported in medieval charters or they are inexistent. But Meaning, do you have any other type of data, like, I don't know, pottery or something? Well, basically, uh, the data we have is pottery. It's uh, it, This is another issue. I mean, uh, now we can discuss on and on. Problem is you have, in, for example, in the, on the territory of North Macedonia, you have very famous archaeological sites being excavated, perhaps a dozen of them. And then you have surveying of terrain where they collected pottery, collected objects, collected coins, and deduced from the pottery the dating and the usage of the site, of potential sites, if they found you know, some, some mm -hmm. visible remnants like walls and so on and so forth. And they interpreted these remnants as potential late antique villages or as villas and so on and so forth. But uh, this is quality of data problem, as you mentioned, yeah. because this is an interpretation <laughs> which I cannot control. I can try to believe it. I can try to believe it. I, I can believe it, but uh, it's questionable, to be honest. It's very questionable. Yeah. I don't know. You could try, for example, the artistic way and you could try to do it. Mm -hmm. But then you have to be very precise about what data are you putting into that because you cannot mix, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, data from text, from data. Uh, mm -hmm. You can mix it in the sense that if you know there is an occupation, you can say it was occupied. Mm -hmm. But if you are dealing, let's say, with, um, I don't know, um, houses, you cannot deal, uh, you cannot yes. put, uh, if you have data only from, I don't know, from a palace, maybe it's not, mm -hmm. you no, know, because maybe there was a palace, but there, there were no houses. Yes. Right. So it depends on your area. In in my case, 
it's clear there were settlements apart from the palaces. Mm -hmm. But in your case, it could be, for example, I don't know if it's an, I don't know, archbishop and it's just a palace. Maybe mm -hmm. you're extrapolating data there. Mm -hmm. So you will actually have to analyze the data thoroughly first to see what method could you could be of use. Because otherwise it's very random. Yes, yes. I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Is, is there another question? I'm not a one-man show here. Please, <laughs> if you have any, any questions, please come forward. It was too much. <laughs> no, I don't think so. It was fascinating. Uh, any other question? Um, OK, I have still one. And, and then I will stop <laughs> it because I think uh, everybody would like to have a coffee or a tea or go home or I don't know. But uh, um, what is the state of your research now? So you showed us uh, the problems you're facing. Um, how do you react to this? And, and what is your stage of, of uh, research and writing at the moment? How, how would you like to tackle your, uh, let's say, hindrances or, or yes? Actually, I'm now in, I, I hope to finish this year or beginning of next year. So I'm already writing. And I didn't do exactly the analysis because I have problems with R as uh, of course Bernard know, uh, and Alex as well, um, because of the nature of my data. Uh, I do need to be very aware of what extension I'm using because when I put the data, um, nothing comes out. I mean, it's very strange. It's like no columns or no nice diagram bars comes out. So I think this is a problem of how I enter the data. This, as I said, these gaps or this destruction mm -hmm. is something is missing there. So now I'm dealing with this. Uh, so I don't have the results of the heuristic weighting. I have the results of the distribution of the houses and I can, for example, point. Now I can say, I can point out that the northern Euphrates Tigris, it will be for me, this will be an area to look into. Even more the Tigris than, as we discussed with uh, Professor Pitak last time, even more the, even the Tigris than the Euphrates. Um, contrary to what we expect uh, before. So I will point to this area. I'm not saying the people came from here, so please don't, don't mistake my words, but um, many commonalities, I would say they come from here, but I want to be sure and I want to see what the heuristic weighting gives me in terms of domestic okay. occupation. Of course, we have the weapons that, uh, and, the, and the tombs. Uh, we have uh, Sylvia Prell and Anna Latifas and Sarah Villan. They have, uh, we have different researchers that we have to put together. And that we have to take into consideration, of course. Um, so yeah, I'm at this point. I'm writing and I'm trying to do the analysis actually to see what's going on. But as I said, uh, we should be honest. I mean, if we encounter a problem, why we should say it? Or even if the analysis doesn't work, that I think it will work in the end because I studied the data and I think it will work. But maybe the picture that will come up, we say nothing. Or maybe we will be discouraging. We don't know. So this is what I'm trying to do now. So I hope to do this uh, at the end of this year or beginning of next year to see what, what's going on. And then when I have the, the analysis, the result of the analysis, and I have everything, maybe we can have a more, uh, this, a more general discussion of what should go into the PhD or not, how, how we should make these conclusions, right? Because it's, it's always difficult. You don't want to generalize or make mistakes or think people assume that you're saying people came from this uh, area. It's like, no, that's not what I meant. Um, so yeah, I'm at this stage, but all everything is collected. Also, I'm trying to deal with settlements in Egypt and not only Avaris. Avaris is the core of my mm -hmm. research, I would say, right? This is very important okay. because I'm, all, I'm always showing these maps because they're very graphic, they're very visual, but the core is Avaris. That, that should be the point because this is the point. This is if we are talking about the Hyksos, of course, Avaris should be the core and the center of my research. Uh, I would like to have a look at other Egyptian settlements, but actually, sadly, there are not many um, that we can compare in terms of temporality. <laughs> but yeah, I hope to incorporate all this. Not for, don't forget the big picture, which is what's going on at Avaris. What's happened? As Karen said, they have a very fine stratigraphy. Uh, the periods are very short and the changes are very uh, visual. Like I saw you in area two, there's a completely change of use of this area. In, in, it's amazing how you can see this. So uh, this, this will be the, the puzzle, right? To see mm -hmm. what's going on in the, in the Near East, so to say, um, Mesopotamia and what's going on in Navarre. How can we deal with this? So yeah. Hopefully we will be there soon. You will know about it. Uh -huh. Aaron, yeah. I think there is another question. Yes, please. Yeah. 
Uh, one more question: When you are dealing with the uh, with the Near Eastern sites, how much are you taking in consideration the bigger landscape, the geography, the ways, like like trading routes, um, how things could have moved? Also, in terms of settlement and architecture, of course. I mean, the how how this could have moved from, let's say, the northern Levant down to 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 the southern Levant and then to Egypt. Yeah, I will. I am trying to incorporate this, but I have to say it's very it's a huge task. If I have to analyze the entire landscape, it's actually a big test. So I'm mostly confiding in what other people have been doing in the Near East, uh, and they already have done this um, roots reconstruction and climatic uh, analysis. So I'm mostly, in this case, I'm mostly confiding in these reports and this work. For example, Jason Ua from, I don't know if he's from Harvard, or I'm, com I'm taking it uh, like this is because they, they do a great job, but I cannot do it myself, not in this research at least. I cannot, it's not possible. Uh, from zero, I mean, I cannot take from zero. It would be great to do a landscape analysis next to this. But on this, I am taking what other people have done about the roots and desert landscapes or uh, climatic uh, events and trying to incorporate this. But as I say, in an act of faith, because I can I cannot accomplish this myself because it will be an, a never-ending task. But yeah, good point, Karen, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Silvia, for your presentation for your very interesting paper for the discussion. Uh, thank you very much to all of you attending. I think it was a really good kickoff uh, of the digital history lectures and uh, we will continue with them in the future, trying to uh, find and, and acquire very interesting speakers also in the future. And uh, so thank you for being with us uh, and hopefully we will see each other again in this format and venue. I yeah, wish you a very you. good evening. Thank you, Mihailo. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.